Hi everybody. Well, it's no surprise to say that the COVID virus has been incredibly disruptive in our lives. It's certainly not business as usual. And that is certainly the case for us as a church as well. And the result of that is that Christians and church leaders around the world have all been asking some big questions. What does it mean to be church? What does church look like going forward into the future when this virus has passed? And uh, what is God doing in the midst of this uh, global disruption? All big questions. It wouldn't surprise you to know that uh, as the leaders of Kingsgate, we've also been wrestling with these questions. And in the process of doing that, we've turned to God's Word and, and looked at the Bible to, to learn from that. We've uh, considered the voices of um, church leaders around the world and prophetic voices. We've looked at prophetic words that have been given to us, some of them by yourselves. We've also looked at um, a series of dreams which we believe have a prophetic edge to them that are vivid and powerful and carry within them a, a prophetic thread which we believe is consistent with everything else we've been hearing. And so with the, all this wrestling and all this questioning that's taken place, and the result of all that is um, this new series that I'm going to be preaching on over the next number of weeks. And it's called Preparing for a Wedding. If we believe that God speaks today and we seek Him and uh, we desire to hear His voice, when we believe He does speak to us or we are hearing what He's saying, it's reasonable and I think faithful for us to, to take that and to, to use it. And that's what we're trying to do over the next couple of weeks in this series, Preparing for a Wedding. Well, when we look at the idea of a wedding, we see that the Bible starts with a wedding and it ends with a wedding. And there's a whole heap of references which take place in the Bible relating to marriage and weddings all along the way. In Genesis chapter 2 verses 21 to 25, we see the union of Adam and Eve and the language that is used in that particular passage is still used in weddings today. And then throughout the, the Bible, as you move from Genesis all the way through to Revelation, you begin to see that actually maybe marriage is about a lot more than just a relationship between a man and a woman. Maybe it's pointing to something bigger. And Paul makes reference to that in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32, when he says this, when he's talking about marriage, this mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Wow. So Marriage is not just about this relationship between two human beings, between a man and a woman, but it's pointing to something much bigger. And we see that vividly portrayed in the book of Revelation, where Jesus returns as this groom to take up his bride, the church, and we see a, a, a wedding feast of the Lamb described, this great wedding feast of the Lamb. Just think of that for a moment. Everything in all creation, all reality, both seen and unseen, is moving towards this one moment, this wedding feast of the Lamb. And nothing can stop it. No policy, no government, no philosophy, no person can stop the movement, this, this um, unstoppable wedding march, if you like, towards this wedding feast. We do not know the time. We do not know the hour. But we do know that today we are closer to that moment than we were yesterday. And in Revelation 19 verse 9, it says, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Those who've put their trust in Jesus to share in the delight and the joy of this moment that has been described in Revelation. But for those who reject the groom, who've rejected Jesus, they are excluded from this feast, excluded from the intimacy that is related to the moment, that is related to this feast, which is the culmination of history. Now, what I'm talking about today, the return of Jesus and the wedding feast of the Lamb, is, is not some kind of fringe doctrine. But if you go to the early church and you read the history of the early church, you see that the coming of Jesus, the return of Jesus, played such a vital part in their understanding, such a vital part in their psyche and, and how they lived. It um, impacted their decisions, uh, their good works, their care for the poor. It impacted their finances, how they used their finances, what their priorities were, their prayer, 
how they understood their calling, um, how they coped and managed to deal with persecution and hardships and uncertainty. All of those things were um, uh, framed or significantly governed, I should say, by their understanding that Jesus was coming again as the groom to take them, the bride, to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And we see this reflected in the New Testament. And uh, there's far too many references to this for me to quote them all. But I'm just going to pick out a few. And, and I'm picking out different New Testament writers. So in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, uh, Luke says, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 9 to 10 says, How you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven. If you like, one of the callings that we have is to wait for the return, faithfully wait for the return of Jesus. Then the Apostle Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 11 to 12, What sort of people ought you to be? in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God. And we see with Peter here how our he expects our lives as Christians to be governed by this reality that Christ is returning. The Apostle John writes in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink from him, in shame at his coming. And when we move beyond the New Testament texts, we see that the church continued to hold this idea that Jesus is coming again as central to their beliefs. When we take our communion, there's much which has been symbolized at the moment, at that, at that moment when we take communion. But certainly one of the things we are doing is we are participating in a foreshadow of the wedding feast of the Lamb, that the feast that we're going to have with Jesus. We might just be having a piece of bread or a wafer or a cracker and a glass of a, a bit of wine or, or, or grape juice, but they symbolize the meal that we are going to have. And when the Apostle Paul speaks about communion in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, he says this, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death, until he comes. You see, Paul is, even in that comment, reflecting about the future expectation of Jesus returning. And when the early church got together um, in the, the, the 200s and the 300s and was working out what were the essential beliefs of the Christian faith, they speak about the return of Jesus. So in the Nicene Creed, it says, He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. So once again, just reiterating here, what we're talking about is not something fringe to the Christian faith, but central. But a question I've been pondering is how much do we actually believe this? I mean, we can give lip service to the idea that Jesus is coming again. But in our hearts, do we, do we really believe it? Because if we do, certainly the expectation is that if we, if we really grasp that Jesus can return at any moment, it would fashion and shape our lives in, in quite a spectacular way. And I want to suggest that maybe many in a Western church context don't really believe with, or, or live or have that sense of expectation of Jesus returning, coming again, the groom to receive his bride. And I want to suggest that there's two reasons for it. It might be more, but these are just two that I want to pick up on today. The first is delay. It's been nearly 2,000 years and since Jesus walked the earth, and he hasn't returned. And so, to some measure, um, we can confess the creeds, but that delay has meant that the church has, has wondered or has a lower expectation of Jesus' return. And one of the results of that is that we, certain theologians and Christians, have spiritualized um, what it means that Jesus is going to return. If you like, they, are, they have take, made it a metaphor, uh, meaning 
that this return actually implies something else or a response to something else. And I just want to say that from the very beginning of the church, Jesus' return was never taught as a metaphor or to as some kind of spiritual thing meaning something else. It was always taught as an anticipated reality. And where there are a number of instances, maybe one or two instances in the New Testament where churches, potentially the one in Thessalonica and the, and the one in Corinth, began to believe that the return of Jesus was something other than an actual return of Jesus. Paul speaks boldly into, into that uh, way of thinking and corrects them because he wants them to know that what he's talking about is not a metaphor, but an actual return of Jesus to receive his bride. And one of the things I think which has happened as a result of this is as the, as the church has lost its focus or understanding or a, an appreciation that Jesus is returning, it's got distracted. Distracted with the many things that, mirror, that are mirrored in the world rather than the kingdom of God. But for those Christians who have, met, have, have kept an understanding that Jesus is returning and it has gripped their imagination, they have become and remain distracted with the kingdom of God rather than with the world around them. Just a couple of things to mention about delay. There are many passages in the Bible uh, where the saints cry out to God, God, where are you? What is taking you so long? And I, I love the fact that the Bible doesn't hide those passages as some kind of embarrassment, but they, the Bible keeps it in, in, in the narrative so we can read them. And virtually every time that those questions are asked, God replies with a, a sentiment which is similar to that found in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3, where he says, If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. And as you read through the Old Testament, you see um, that there are a number of times where, for example, with Abraham, where God promises him a son. 25 years, no fulfillment of this of the seeming, seeming fulfillment of this promise. But eventually, in the right time, as God decides and knows, he delivers on his promise. 400 years, the nation of Israel in captivity, in the right time, in the right place, for his glory, God acts. It might be slow in coming as far as we're concerned, but not in relation to what God knows. So the early church may have been mistaken in their timing of Jesus' return, but they were not mistaken in the inevitability of the event that they waited for. The next reason why I think uh, many in the church uh, have marginalized this key doctrine that Jesus is returning is because of a very deep theological term called wackiness. And uh, there's two things I want to talk under this heading of wackiness. The first thing is the whole idea of Jesus returning seems a little bit weird to our sophisticated uh, Western mindset. But it's good to remember that the gospel has always sounded a bit strange. It's always sounded a bit weird. And when you read through uh, the Paul's letters, you see that the early listeners of the gospel will say, What? God became flesh? Died naked and humiliated on a cross? Are you mad? And even when Paul spoke about the resurrection to the people in Athens, and you read about this in the book of Acts, they said, they scoffed at him. How can you talk such ridiculous nonsense? So here's the thing. If we are going to make the sophisticated Western mindset the paradigm for what is believable, we will end up rejecting all of the gospel. The gospel is supernatural. It challenges our sensibilities. It always has, whether it is the cross or the return of Jesus. But there is something else I want to talk about under this, this theological term of wackiness. And that is that there are some very uh, unhelpful elements of the church who've developed very strange theologies about Jesus' return and have become so focused on trying to predict the date and time when Jesus is going to return, which is incidentally something that Jesus himself said was impossible to do. And uh, so certain churches have become particularly preoccupied 
about the end times to the point that really what they're concerned about is trying to decode uh, some kind of uh, elements of the book of Revelation and get so focused on those things that they pay very little concern to uh, the fact that we are meant to make a difference and impact the world today, tomorrow, next week. So, um, and I think some elements of that, of that teaching have put people off from even going into that space. So delay and wackiness means that the topic of Jesus' return can often be marginalized and avoided. And yet we find it all through the New Testament. So I'm not suggesting that the church should get preoccupied with end times theology. Start building bunkers and preparing, you know, uh, stacking food and becoming doomsday preppers. Please, couldn't think of anything worse. I'm not suggesting that. But what I am saying is I think that the church should increasingly live with a deep awareness and expectation that Jesus is coming. Because when we do that, we are in fact um, uh, imitating Paul himself and, and following his own teaching, following the teaching of Jesus. So not only should we be a church which lives with a deep awareness that Jesus is coming, but that we as his bride want to be ready when he does. And the Apostle Paul, in possibly his last letter before he was executed for his faith, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 8, he says this, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. And I think that's what I'm trying to emphasize. And I think it's something that God is trying to capture our attention with. Is will we be a people who long for his appearing? Who, who, and, who, uh, who anticipate his return and long for his appearing? And when we do that, I think there are two things which, which we benefit. And I just want to finish off with these two points. Why is this important? Well, first of all, hope and joy. All the things that we face today, trials, tribulations, difficulties, pain, suffering, grief, they are all put into perspective when we look at them through the reality that Jesus is coming back as this incredible groom to take us his bride to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And Paul recognizes this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. He says, For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond comparison. What we go, what he's going through now is nothing compared to what he will have. In fact, it's almost as if the struggles, the battles, the difficulties, the afflictions that Paul is going through, he says, is preparing the bride making her beautiful for her wedding day. Because here's the thing, what makes the bride beautiful to Jesus is her faith. And there is something about us holding on in the midst of struggle and difficulty that causes our faith to blossom, to become refined and beautiful. The thing that Paul is hoping for in this paragraph, in this, in this verse that he's speaking about, is not some metaphor, as I said, but it's an absolute reality that he's expecting. Hoping for Christ's return is an essential element of perseverance, giving us hope and joy in the most difficult moments. And when we marginalize this idea and we, and we, and we don't think about the fact that Jesus is coming back, we actually remove from ourselves one of the, the incredible gifts that God has given us to keep the faith, to not give up, even when things are dark. Nothing that we go through in this life, as horrible as it might be, is the final word. The wedding feast of the Lamb is our final word, and that should give us hope and joy. The second reason is focus. When we uh, remind ourselves that Jesus is returning, it helps us to focus on the things that really matter, how we spend our time, and it gives us a perspective that puts riches, pleasures, aspirations, selfishness, even our fears in their proper place. And reminds us what to live for. Reminds us 
what to focus on, reminds us what to prioritize. And these are some of the reasons why I feel God is causing us or, or, or speaking to us about remembering that He will come again. I pray that uh, as you reflect on this today, it will stir you with hope and joy, as well as focusing you about the years and the months and the years ahead. May the Lord bless you and keep you and turn His face to shine upon you.